Welcome to the second half of lecture 23. Here we're talking about a T distribution with a single population. Now, what we're going to look at here are a couple examples of a T distribution. A T distribution tests the mean. With it, we're going to look at how do you determine the mean of rolling 10 six sided die? How do you determine the probability that 10 six sided die will be more than 44.5? things you can do with dice. Previously, we looked at five card stud. We can do a Monte Carlo simulation to find out the probability of getting things like three of a kind. Every time I run the Monte Carlo simulation, I get a different answer. Well, a t-test is where you get to find out how do you take that into account? How do I determine the actual odds of getting three of a kind based upon a Monte Carlo simulation? Hector Airport's been collecting weather data in Fargo since 1942. With that, I can sit there and say I've got a finite sample size. What's the probability it's going to break 90 degrees Fahrenheit this coming year? Or what's the 90% confidence interval for the hottest it's going to get in April? If I take a AA battery and let it discharge, I can measure how much energy is in the battery in joules. Repeat that with four different batteries. I've got four measurements. From those four measurements, how much energy does the AA battery have? And what's the chance given batteries got more than 500 milliamp hours? Those are some things we can do with the t-test. So the basis of all the t-test is the central limit theorem. That says that anything that you measure typically converges to a normal distribution. And a normal plus normal is normal. The two parameters that you need to define a normal distribution are the mean and standard deviation. And what a normal distribution looks like is your normal bell-shaped curve, the stuff you're very familiar with, grades, height, weight, things like that follow a normal distribution. This is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's called a standard normal curve. What I can do with that are things like dice. If I roll 10 six-sided dice, or 10d6, I want to know what's the mean and what's the probability of rolling 45 or higher. Well, one way to do that is enumeration or convolution. I can go through every possible roll of 10 six-sided dice and get what the actual answer is. So if I have a single six-sided die, there's no chance I'm going to roll a zero. One is six chance of getting one, two, three, four, five, and six. Here's two six-sided dice. That's convol convolve it. Four-sided dice convolve two six-sided dice. Eight-sided dice convolve four and four. Ten-sided die convolve eight and two. So eight plus two is ten. The sum is the average. The average is 35. And the probability of getting numbers 45 and higher, again, the counting is a little bit off. The first entry is 0. The second entry is 1. So 46 really means 45. Add up all the scores, 45 and higher, it's 3.9%. So on the bell-shaped curve, add up this area, I get 3.9%. That's the actual answer. I can get the same answer using the central limit theorem. I know the mean and variance of a single six-sided die. If I roll 10 six-sided dice, the mean will scale be 10 times. The variance will scale. Variance is also 10 times. Again, note it's not the standard deviation that scales, it's the variance. The z-score, for 44.5, is 1.75. Again, what the z-score is, is the distance to the mean in terms of standard deviations. So here's 44.5. Here's the mean. I want to know what that distance is in terms of standard deviations. That's your z-score, 1.75. I can then use a normal distribution and look up the number 1.75 and convert that to a probability. And the actual area is 3.9%. With the student t-test, I can get the same answer using a sample. Now, with a student t-distribution, the mean is just like you had before. It's the average. The standard deviation is a little bit different. Here, I divide by n minus 1. And for a normal distribution, I divide by n. It's the average distance to the mean squared. A t-distribution, it's 1 over n minus 1. And the reason for that is I can't estimate two parameters with a single measurement. If I just have a single measurement where n equals 1, 
I can find the average of a number, that's okay, but the second measurement doesn't make any sense. What I'm going to get is 0 over 0. I need at least two measurements to get a standard deviation. The t-score is just like the z-score. It's the distance to the mean in terms of standard deviations. Uh, but it uses slightly different numbers. It uses the measured mean, the measured standard deviation. So it's got a slightly different name, t. That reminds you that this isn't a normal distribution. It's actually t distribution. And the degrees of freedom are n minus 1. And cut a note, there's a slight difference. Individuals versus population. If I look at an individual, like I, I roll the dice, I want to know next time I roll the die, what I'm going to get, that's an individual. That has this mean, that standard deviation. If I want to know about the population, when I roll the dice, there is an average for the population. What is that average? For populations, I divide the variance by n, or equivalently, divide the standard deviation by the square root of n. Essentially, I know more about populations than individuals. So as the sample size goes to infinity, I know what the population's average is. The standard deviation goes to zero. For an individual, um, standard deviation doesn't converge. Well, it doesn't go to zero. It just becomes whatever the population standard deviation is. So you kind of have to watch the question. Am I asking about an individual the next time I roll the dice or a population? What's the overall average? And again, a t-table, like we did last lecture, looks like this. It's similar to a normal distribution. That's the bottom row. But it takes sample size into account. As the sample size goes to infinity, a t-distribution converges to a normal di distribution. If the sample size isn't infinity, I'm a little bit more cautious. So the number of standard deviations have to go out to capture, say right here, 5%. It goes from 1.645. It gets bigger and bigger. The less data I have, the more conservative I have to be. And a sample size less than 2 is kind of nonsense. So it stops right here. So again, that was a t-table. To illustrate how to do that, suppose I want to know uh, what happens when I roll 10d6. Well, if I roll the dice one time, suppose I got 42, what does that tell me? Well, it tells me absolutely nothing. If you calculate it, the mean is 42. The standard deviation is how far is 42 from 42? That's 0. Over n minus 1 is 0. So there's the standard deviation, 0 over 0. Uh, basically, I can't do anything with a single data point. I need at least 2. If I want to know what happens when I roll two six-sided dice, I could roll the dice two times. I'm going to get a pretty wide, wide variety of answers if I only roll it twice. But suppose I get a 29 and a 36. With just two measurements, I can actually do something. With two measurements, I've got a mean. I've got a standard deviation. And in MATLAB, the STD, it actually does the sample standard deviation. This is 1 over n minus 1, because they assume you're collecting data. If you have the entire population, that's when you divide by n. That's a normal distribution. This is a sampled sample size of 2. Uh, MATLAB assumes 1 over n minus 1. So this is correct. The standard deviation is 6.34. It's correct for how we're doing the problem. With only two measurements, I can now do something. I can tell you the 90% confidence interval. Next time I roll the die, I'm going to get some number. Uh, what is that number going to be with a probability of 0.9? So this is p is 0.9. What I want to do is get 5% tails. To do that, I want to know how far do I have to go from the mean in terms of standard deviations. That's your t-score. Again, very similar to a z-score, but take sample size into account. Here I've got a sample size of 2, meaning 1 degree freedom. 5% tails is right here, 6.31. So 90% of the time, I expect to get numbers within 6.31 standard deviations of the mean. So I know the mean, I know the standard deviation, plug it in. I get minus 6 to plus 73. So I'm 90% certain that the die will be somewhere between minus 6 and 73. Now, minus 6 seems kind of nonsense, and it is. 
The problem is I only have sample size of two. And the math doesn't know these are dice. It doesn't know it can't go negative. So with only sample size of two, I got to be really cautious. Go left and right six standard deviations. And that's where it got negative. If I want to know what's the chance my next roll is bigger than 44.5. Again, I look at this point, 44.5. How far is 44.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? That's your t-score. I'm 1.75 standard deviations out. So I look for the number at 1.75, and it's in here somewhere. So it's about 18%, 16.69% actually. So 60% chance I'm going to roll a number bigger than 44.5. This is with only two die rolls. If I want to know about the population, such as this die has an average. I'm going to roll 10 six-sided die. There is an average. What is it going to be? Well, populations, I know more about populations than individuals. So for populations, the standard deviation, kind of looks like this, squeezes down. And it squeezes down by 1 over square root of n. Sample size of 2, I squeeze the standard deviation down by square root of 2. So that's now my confidence interval. I'm 90% certain that the average of rolling 10 six-sided dice is somewhere in this range. And that's a pretty wide range, but I only have two measurements. And the chance that the population is mean is bigger than 39.5. And so far is 39.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations, 1.33. 1.33 standard deviations is right around here is 20.48%. So there's a 20% chance that the population's mean is bigger than 39.5. I can tell all that with just two die rolls. Now the actual mean of 10 six-sided dice is 35. That's right in the middle of this range. So it's consistent. This might be a fair die. With only two measurements, I'm not really sure what the mean is. I'm pretty sure it's between 5 and 61. Meaning as far as I can tell, this is a fair die. That's with only two rolls. If I increase the number of rolls, say five times, I'm going to get five data points. Find the mean, find the standard deviation, sample size is five. With sample size of five, I now go down to here on the t-table. There's a big, big advantage going from sample size of two to three, or one degree freedom to two degrees freedom. Two, three to four, four to five. So you're going from sample size of two to five is a big deal. Uh, this dropped almost by a factor of three. With the sample size of five, I can tell you the 90% confidence interval. Again, I want 5% tails. With four degrees of freedom, this row, 5% tails is right here. I want to go plus or minus 2.13 standard deviations from the mean. That gives me 24 to 44. And the chance that my next roll will be bigger than 44.5 gives you a t-score of 2.16, uh, right around here, about 5%, actually 4.83%. If I want to know about the population, such as what is the population's average? Uh, the answer is 35, because I know what the answer is, it's, uh, 10 six-sided dice. From my data, the standard deviation drops by the square root of the sample size. Again, I want to go 2.13 standard deviations left and right. That gives me 5% tails. Going left and right, 2.13 says that the population's average is somewhere between 29 and 38. Again, 35 is right in that range. So as far as I can tell, this is a fair die. And the chance that it's bigger than 39.5 is now only 3%. Again, kind of where that relates is I've got a product coming off the line. I want to know what is the average weight of that product. What is the average gain in the transistor? More and more data points means I'm getting more and more certain as to what it is. And I can reject things like this. If this means a failure, um, only 3% chance that it's bigger than 39.5. If I roll the dice 21 times, 
I've got a mean, standard deviation. Now 21 rolls means 20 degrees of freedom. And 5% tails, want to go left and right, 1.73. I'm not too far from infinity at this point. Infinity, I'd go left and right, 1.6445 standard deviations. Sample size of 21, I go 1.73. Get a little bit cautious because of a finite sample size. If you want to know about the next die roll, I'm converging to the actual probability. Um, 29.6 to 41 is what my next roll should be. And the chance the next roll is more than 44.5, find the t-score. 2.55 is right around here, is about 1%. Again, for the population, I want to know what is the average for rolling 10 six-sided dice? The standard deviation drops by the square root of the sample size. That t-score drops as we go down the table. Put them together, I'm getting a better and better estimate of what the average is for the 10 six-sided dice. And if I want to know what's the chance that the average is actually bigger than 39.5, that's actually six standard deviations out, basically 0%. So with only 21 measurements, I've got a pretty good idea what the average is for the dice. And I can definitely rule out that the average is not bigger than 39.5. Finally, roll the dice a thousand times. A thousand times, you're basically at a normal distribution. And note with a thousand rolls, the individual, the spread, doesn't disappear. If I roll 10 six-sided dice, I'm going to get a lot of variability. That's what this shows. This is converging to the actual 90% confidence interval for rolling 10 six-sided dice. The chance that I'm bigger than 44.5, again, is how far is 44.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations, 1.74. That's in this range. That's 4%. These numbers don't go to zero. That just becomes what the distribution's probabilities are. In contrast, if I look at the population, the standard deviation drops by the square root of the sample size. As I go more and more, the t-scores get smaller and smaller. I now know that the mean is somewhere between 34.6 and 35.2. As the sample size goes to infinity, I will know what the sample mean is what the population's mean is. And again, I can say most definitely it is not bigger than 39.5. So kind of in summary, as they get more and more die rolls, a single roll is meaningless. With two rolls, I can actually do something. I can tell you, say for the population, the mean of 10 six-sided dice is somewhere between 5 and 61. As they get more and more data, I can narrow down what the population's mean is, and eventually I get more and more digits. For individuals, eventually I converge to what the distribution is for the actual data. 10 six-sided dice has a bell-shaped curve like this. It does have a 90% confidence interval. That's what I'm estimating eventually. When I do my 90% confidence interval, as the rolls get bigger and bigger, and I don't need a huge number. With a thousand, I basically have the right answer. I was pretty darn close with a sample size of five. So that's kind of the idea behind a t, t distribution. So let's do a couple examples. Um, back early in the semester, we were doing card games. Like if I want to draw three of a kind in five card stud, I can calculate what are the odds I can use combinatorics to calculate the odds. I can use Monte Carlo simulation. With, with, with enumeration and combinatorics, I get the exact answer. There are 54,912 ways of getting three of a kind. There's 2.5 million different poker hands. So the chance of being dealt three of a kind is 2.11%. Using combinatorics, I got the same answer. Well, instead of doing that, let's look at Monte Carlo. With Monte Carlo, I deal out a poker hand and check, is it three of a kind? Based upon these numbers, in 100,000 hands, I should get three of a kind 
21.12.84 times. Well, if I run a Monte Carlo simulation with 100,000 hands, here's what I'm getting. Every time I run it, I get a different answer. So here's how many times I got four of a kind, full house, three of a kind, two pair, pair. Again, that's typical of Monte Carlo. I keep on getting different answer every time I run it. From that data, can I tell you what the actual odds are of getting three of a kind? Can I can do that using enumeration or combinatorics. Suppose I don't want to do that. Can I tell you what it is using Monte Carlo? With Monte Carlo, I can't run it single time. Again, sample size of one is meaningless. I need to run it a couple times. Let's run it 11 times. Gives me these 11 numbers. Can I have to watch what am I doing? Individual test or population test? Individual test says these numbers vary. What is the range of these numbers with a probability of 0.9? Okay, so I've got a mean, I've got a standard deviation, I've got a sample size of 10. That means, correction, sample size of 11, meaning 10 degrees of freedom. If I want 5% tails, there's my t-score on a t-table, 1.81. So I want to go left and right, 1.81 standard deviations. Well, I've got my data right here. I can find the mean. I can find the standard deviation. Doing that, I get this is my range. So what that tells me is that when I run this Monte Carlo simulation, 90% of the time, I'm going to get somewhere between 2014 and 2207, three of a kinds. I can calculate what's the chance I'm going to get more than 2200, three of a kinds, in 10,000 hands, 100,000 hands. Well, this is just how far is 2199 from the mean in terms of standard deviations. I'm 1.66 standard deviations out. Using the t-score, look for 1.66 standard deviations. That's between these two numbers. Or use stat track, 6.34%. 6.3% of the time, I'll get more than 2200, three of a kinds. That's this number right here. 6% uh, of the time, this number is going to be bigger than 2200. And like here's an example where that happened. That's from an individual. What the population is looking at is there is an average, but there is a probability for getting three of a kind. Can I tell you what that probability is? Well, again, for populations, the mean or the standard deviation drops by the square root of the sample size. So sample size of 11 means I want to go left and right, 1.81 standard deviations. That gives me the 90% confidence interval, 5% tails. Uh, and standard deviation drops by the sample size. This is for a population. So this tells me that I'm 90% certain that the actual probability, or the actual numbers are in this range. That's the number of times I should get three of a kind with 100,000 draws. Um, or the probability P times 100,000. Now, again, I know what the actual answer is from enumeration. The actual number is 2112.84, and that's in this range. So I don't really know what it is based upon the data. I only have 11 data points, but I can give you a ballpark for what that probability is. And I can tell you, what's the chance it's more than 2150? It's how much is, how far is 2150 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? Again, this is for the population, 2.4. There's a 1.7% chance that the true odds are bigger than 2150. That's for five card stud. And that's kind of what's happening when you run a Monte Carlo. Every time I run a Monte Carlo, I get different answers. From that data, take a bunch of data, I can sit there and do a t-test. With a t-test, I don't know what the actual probability is, but I can give you a range. And as the sample size goes to infinity, the number of Monte Carlo runs it goes, I take goes to infinity, I can narrow this down. And where it should converge, so assuming I did a calculations right, it should converge to the actual odds. Uh, some more things you can do with a t-test. Well, let's look at some weather in Fargo. Hector Airport's been recording weather data in Fargo since 1942. 
This is the high in July, every year since 1942. From this data, what's the probability it's going to break 100 degrees this coming July? Well, this data is a normal distribution. Again, that's the central limit theorem. It has a mean, has a standard deviation, has number of data points. The mean standard deviation tells you this is the distribution of the high for July. What I want to know is what's the area to the right of 100? How far is 100 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? That's your t-score. The t-score is 1.34. Using a t-table with 79 degrees of freedom, this area is 9.17% chance. So it's about one year out of every 11. It should break 100 in July. I can tell you what the 90% confidence interval for July is. This coming July, I expect the high to be somewhere in this region. Again, I've got this bell-shaped curve, want 5% tails. From a t-table, I can find out how far was the t-score for 5% tails, and it's 1.665. Pretty close to what it is for normal distribution. Again, I've got 79 degrees of freedom, sample size of 80. It's getting close to infinity. So if I take the mean plus minus 1.66 standard deviations, I get this. 90% of the time, or nine years out of 10, the high in July should be between 87 and 101. And again, go, going to stat track, I've got 79 degrees of freedom, 5% tails, the t-score is 1.665. So with weather data, that's technically a t-distribution because we have a finite set of weather data. Another example, suppose I bought a AA battery. I want to know how much energy is in that AA battery. Well, I can run an experiment and determine that. If I take a AA battery, connect it across a 10-ohm resistor, what's going to happen is the voltage versus time is going to do something like this. It starts out about 1.5 volts and then kind of decays and then goes to zero. As I do that, I know the energy in the battery. I know the voltage, the power is V squared over R. Take the voltage, square it, divide by 10, that's the power. Integrate it, I get energy in joules. So that's the experiment. I'm gonna connect a 10 ohm resistor across the battery, let it discharge, measure the voltage while it's discharging. After I collect the data, I will calculate V squared over R, the power, integrate, that's the energy in the battery. In addition, I need to do this with at least two batteries because a single data point doesn't tell you anything. I need at least two data points to calculate a standard deviation. So I did that, used four batteries, uh, the reason for four is when you buy a pack of batteries from Hornbachers, you get a four pack. I didn't use more than four because they were like four or five bucks for a four pack. I uh, didn't want to spend too much money on this. But anyway, collect some data. That's what the voltage looks like um, for a AA battery discharging across the 10 ohm resistor. Now, one challenge with this is I can't really do a t-test with this data. It's a graph. I've got to take each data set and convert it to a number. If I have four numbers, I can find a mean and a standard deviation, but I've got to convert this graph to a number somehow. So there's a couple of ways to do it. The standard is the time it takes to get to one volt. And so it'd be this number, that number, those are my four numbers. That's a perfectly valid answer. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I don't follow directions very well. Instead, what I'm going to do is take this as the voltage, square it, and say power is V squared over R, integrate it, and this area right here is the energy in joules. Let's do these calculations. Again, I take each curve, convert it to a number. So doing that, the energy in joules for the four batteries were 2937, 3204, 3063, 3019. 
And the reason for the six is I sample the data once every six seconds. So the volts squared over R is watts. I'm assuming the same watts for six seconds. Area is width times height. There's the width, there's the height. The other gives you area. Add them all up, I get joules. So anyway, I've got four numbers now. With four numbers, I can do something. With four numbers, I can find the mean, I can find the standard deviation. So again, I'm going to get a bell-shaped curve looking like this. There's the mean, 3056. The spread comes from the standard deviation. I can determine the 90% confidence interval. With a sample size of 3, the t-score is 2.355. That gives me 5% tails. So go left and right, 2.355 standard deviations. I get this range. So I'm 90% certain that for any given battery, the energy in it is going to be somewhere between 2793 and 3319. And that's kind of what it looks like. Here's the normal distribution. There's the mean, standard deviation. This tail is 5%, and this tail is 5%. It doesn't quite look like 5%. Again, this is because this is actually a normal distribution. A T distribution is similar to a normal, but the tails get lifted up. That takes sample size into account. But MATLAB doesn't have a T distribution function. It's not that I know of. I can answer a question like, what percentage of batteries have at least 500 milliamp hours? Um, that's the rated energy for a AA battery at least the ones that I bought. So I can get, convert 500 milliamp hours to joules, assuming 1.5 volts, the rated voltage, 1.5 volts at 500 milliamp hours times 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute. 500 milliamp hours is the same thing as 2,700 joules. So what I want to know is, here's 2,700. Uh, what is this area to the right of 2,700? Well, to do that, I find the t-score. How far is 2,700 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? It's 3.18 standard deviations away. Going to a t-table. If I have 3 degrees of freedom, sample size of 4, for batteries, I'm 3.18 standard deviations away from the mean. The area of the tail is 2.5%. So based upon my data, 2.5% of the batteries will not meet specs. Or 97.5% do meet specs, which is actually pretty good. So that's kind of some of the things you can do with a T distribution. If I don't know the population's mean and standard deviation, all I have to do is collect some data. I can do things like collect the data on a battery. I can collect the data. Um, what the other things that we add? like uh, weather, temperature, things like that. If you do know the mean and standard deviation, I don't have to do that. I know what the distribution is. Use a normal distribution. If I don't know the mean and standard deviation, I can use the t-table. Collect some data from that, estimate the mean and standard deviation, but then I use the t-table. And a couple things to note. When you do this, I need a sample size of at least two. A sample size of one is meaningless. With a sample size of 1, the standard deviation becomes 0 over 0. I really can't do anything with that. You need at least sample size of 2. With a sample size of 2, you actually can do something. It's going to be pretty conservative, but you can actually get results. More measurements, of course, help, but you get diminishing returns. And if you're estimating something related to the population versus individual, you divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. What that does for you as the sample size gets bigger and bigger, I eventually know what does the population's mean. For example, with cards, if I want to know what's the chance of getting three of a kind, I can run a Monte Carlo simulation. As I run more and more simulations, I get more and more certain as to what, or I can narrow down the band over which the, I'm 90% certain that the actual probability lies in. So eventually kind of converge to what the actual probability is. 
but I can't give you a number because area of a number is zero. I've got to give you a range. So that's the t-test with a single population.